and a welcome to Liberty Baptist here, PM edition. So far, I'm telling you, so far, everything is going wonderful today. And God is, we've already spent time with God this morning, men's prayer. We spent God again, uh, spent time with God again during uh, Sunday school with the new, with the new book. And we spent a lot of time with him during the service. And now we get to spend time with him again. So how can it, can it get any better? Can it? We are going to start off this evening with number 201. So if we could open to 201 and rise up. More about Jesus. More about Jesus would I know. That's why we come to church, to get more about Jesus, more of Jesus, more of his word, more fellowship with those who are in Jesus, etc., etc. So we want God's presence to be obvious with us tonight. Sunday night is not second rate. It's not supposed to be the leftovers. It's just supposed to be a, 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 a carryover, yes sir, a carryover of what the Lord's all, already been up to uh, this day. So let's pray, let's seek him, let's acknowledge him, and yield ourselves to him. Would you do that? Let's not just uh, have a rope prayer, but let's commit ourselves to the, the Spirit of God. Lord in heaven, uh, we're grateful uh, for what this day represents. This is the Lord's day. This is your day. Uh, this is the day that we've come out from our regular routine to worship and serve and praise you and yield to you together as the church. And so, God, uh, we want to thank you for what you have done this morning. Um, what you've done in our midst so far today. Thank you for the afternoons that we've had, whether they were restful, eventful, um, uh, whether we received news or, um, Lord, things of that nature. Help us to be here on purpose tonight and to see you working. May we uh, be careful to put thought into what we're singing. Uh, may we be cheerful givers should we be giving to the offering tonight. May we just receive the word with meekness. Help our pastor as he teaches and preaches and feeds us the word of God. And may we be careful to um, fellowship with one another, to linger, to be the body of Christ uh, before we go into a new week. 
Thank you, God, for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's open up to 340. 340. Verily, verily. Oh, what a Savior that he died for me and you. Let's raise our voice up to the Lord. Here we go. First verse. Thank you. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you for standing. Verily, verily means truly, truly. This is the truth. So thank you for singing. Um, so, hey, we got to, off to a good start this morning with uh, the lesson series, Experiencing God. And so I hope that was a blessing and you're encouraged uh, to read chapter two. And really, as far as I know, after this, I won't say anything out about it in announcements from here on out. So just wanted to acknowledge uh, the Lord was good to us this morning. And so um, All In Outreach is coming up this Saturday at 930 and so if you come on out, uh, you'll get to experience a, a light continental breakfast as well. And when you come, uh, we're not just going to have one job for everybody to do, but there will be three groups that um, will we'll be together and will be working together. So there's going to be at-home visits that can be made, specific visits that pastor may have organized and wants us to participate with. So that's an option. And then there are door hangers that can be put out in neighborhoods, so neighborhoods that can be canvassed, and so that's pretty simple. And then if you're unable to walk or it would be more convenient for you, you'll be able to stay behind and, and write postcards that will be put out into the mail. And I think, how many of those went out to maybe um, those who came to the Back to School Bash last time? So last time we had this, about 25 postcards were written to uh, families who participated in the Back to School Bash. And so in their mailbox, they had just a note from Liberty Baptist Church, and so that, that's that's something, and so this is what you can participate in, so this Saturday, 9.30, and we should be able to go out and do those things around 10 o'clock, and then on March the 16th, we'll have the Rock of Ages Prison Ministry Training um, here at the church, and so if you're interested in getting into the prison system to minister the Word of God in an organized and professional way, come out to the training on Saturday the 16th at 3 o'clock. 
And then starting up again on March 11th is the men's Bible study that will resume on that Monday, March 11th at 7 o'clock. And so please come for a roundtable discussion and arm wrestling. I'm just kidding. Hey. All right. That was getting just a little too stale there, so I had to throw that in. Okay. <laughs> and study. Okay. So not the arm wrestling. Unless you want to. Unless there's, you know, it's just a lot of, anyway, I'll stop there. All right. Uh, so on that note, let's um, take up the offering. All right. Let's take up the offering, and uh, at the same time, we'll sing page 114, Tell It to Jesus, 114. So let's pray, ask God's blessing. God, thank you for meeting our needs. You're a faithful God, and you're worthy of our worship, of the demonstration of our faith uh, that is uh, demonstrated through our giving. And so God, bless tonight uh, those who will give by faith those giving to faith promise, giving, those just giving out of obedience. And so make us cheerful givers. Bless what is given. May it be used and stewarded to your glory. In Christ's name, amen. I will remain seated. And, you know, <clears throat> if you want a better relationship with Christ, talk to him. He wants to hear you. That's right. He wants that relationship. That's how you build your relationship with Christ. You talk to him. And this, this, this hymn here, tell it to Jesus. Are you weary? Are you heavy-hearted? Tell it to Jesus. That's right. Amen. Are you grieving over joys departed? Tell it to Jesus. Do you have an issue in a family? Tell it to Jesus. Anything. Mm -hmm. Just talk to him. He wants to hear from you. And he, trust me, you will hear from him. Amen. So let's begin Hymn number 114, Tell It to Jesus. Great if we turned it on, all right. 
Excellent. So welcome back to those who are watching online and for everyone else. Uh, well, you heard all that. But anyway, I'll say it again because we're recording this. Turn your Bibles, please, to 1 Samuel chapter number 3 this evening as we continue our study on Samuel and lessons in leadership from 1 Samuel. And of course, Samuel's life is now going to begin for us in the narrative of what we've seen so far. We've really taken a long look at his mother, Hannah, haven't we? We've seen how she has changed the course of Israel. This woman of prayer uh, has changed the nation of Israel much more so than Eli did as the high priest. Of course, last week we also looked at Hophni and Phinehas, those two wicked sons that Eli should have restrained, uh, but instead, what did he do? He kind of gave them a slap on the wrist and let them continue their wicked ways. But we're going to have Samuel enter the scene here as a young man, and even as a young man, much younger than Eli or Hophni or Phinehas or even Hannah, obviously his mother, we're going to see that God is going to use him in a very great way, and I believe there's a particular reason why God was able to use him. And there's a characteristic in his life that we also need to make sure that we apply as we look at these lessons and leadership. You know, uh, pastors, I don't know if you realize this, but we as pastors, we have a lot of cute sayings that we like to say uh, a, a lot. Uh, trite sayings, maybe we even put that way. They're a little bit tired. They're a little bit old, uh, but yet we enjoy saying them anyway. I won't rehearse some of mine uh, for you here this evening, although surely you're probably thinking of some of them right now. But I can tell you one that I have used very much in the past that I have heard other pastors say in the past. You may have had other pastors yourself who have said this in the past. In fact, it's a, a, a truth that goes beyond even something biblical. It's biblical truth. It's truth because it's God's truth. But sometimes you can hear this other realms as well, not just in church. But that's this. The greatest ability is availability. Ever heard that before? The greatest ability is availability. And I've said that before in the past. And I've heard it preached. I've heard it in the secular workplace before. The idea that the greatest ability is availability. But you know, it's interesting, thank you very much for that, brother. It's interesting that as you study the Word of God, and as you particularly study this passage that we have here in 1 Samuel chapter number 3, I have to question the basis upon which I have said that for the past, well, I don't know how many years. Because availability is important. Hey, it's a good thing that you're here tonight. <laughs> it's being available for service is an important thing. You can't begin to serve until you're, well, available to serve. But I would hear, I'm here to tell you this evening that perhaps, as I want to provoke your thinking a little bit tonight, there is something that is greater for us than simply availability. In a message that I have entitled, The Greatest Ability Is Not Availability. Ooh, controversy. All right. Are you ready? Oh, man. Here we go. All right, let's see. See, then when we're done, arm wrestling, all right? Uh, no, um, <laughs> this table's been set before us, all right? <laughs> well, on that very spiritual note, let's all stand for the reading of God's Word. I love the people that will listen to that on the podcast and wonder, why is he talking about arm wrestling? They'll have no idea the context behind that. And as we know from the Word of God, context is everything. Yeah, be a church, all right. <laughs> when you miss, you miss out, so... 1 Samuel chapter 3, we're really going to cover the whole chapter, but I just want us to read the first four verses to begin, and then we'll make uh, readings from the rest of the chapter as we continue. And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. Now, that may actually sound like a good thing, the word of God being precious, but it's actually not as good as it might sound at first blush. And we'll look at that in just a moment. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was and Samuel was laid down to sleep, that the Lord called Samuel and he answered, here am I. He's available. He's available. This young man has made himself available to God. Now, certainly, that's greater than what we've seen from Eli and Hophni and Phinehas. And he must be applauded for that. And we certainly must see that this is a blessing that he has the type of heart that he wants to hear the Lord speak. And we'll see why that's even more amazing here in just a few moments. But yet, I believe as we continue to read the text, there is something that we find here that is even more important than simply being available, as important as it is. And we'll continue this controversial thought in just a moment as you're seated and we pray together. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for this evening. And I do want to echo the prayer that was made just a few moments ago by our brother Dan. Uh, the fact that uh, we didn't just come here to come here tonight. We're not here just simply to check a box for attendance. 
just to say that we've done something, that we've achieved something. In fact, I believe what we see here from your word tonight would prove that to be actually the very opposite of what we're supposed to do in our Christian walk. Help us, Lord, to learn. Help us, Lord, to grow and to be the people that you've called us to be. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we jump into our text tonight, I want us to consider another lesson in leadership as we look at Samuel, the very foundation of his life. And really, in many ways, Samuel, you could debate that he would be on the Mount Rushmore of leaders in the history of Israel. There were many great leaders in the history of Israel. Samuel, one of the greatest, maybe even one of the more underrated of the leaders in Israel's history, who we can find very little about him and his life that is going to be questionable, very little in his life that we find that would be a blemish upon his record. This strong and stable leader, and it really all starts here with what we see in his life in chapter number three. And as we look at this, first of all, I want us to see the calling of Samuel. That's in the first seven verses here, the calling of Samuel. And it says at the beginning that the Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. He's already begun to serve the Lord. In fact, it's interesting that this was mentioned already two times about Samuel ministering before the Lord. It was mentioned in verse number 11 and verse number 18 of the previous chapter. So three times already as a young man, what do we see? He's ministering unto the Lord. And again, it says that the word of God was precious in those days, that there was no open vision. And again, when we think of something being precious, we think of something of great value, don't we? Not necessarily even something that's of high financial value, but it's something that's very meaningful and something that has great weight. In fact, just before the church, uh, Brother Dave was trying to help me find my glasses once again. By the way, who are you all? Uh, but uh, he was trying to help me find my glasses, and he found a pair of glasses on my bookshelf. And he said, what about these? And I said, well, those are actually my mother's glasses. It was the last pair of glasses my mom had before she passed. And I had them on my, on my uh, bookshelf along with some other things that are precious to me. Now, if you were to liquidate all of my assets and someone was to come in with an estate sale, let's say, and try to assign a value to the things that I have on those bookshelves, maybe not many people would find a lot of value in them, particularly my mother's old glasses. Uh, but to me, they're precious. They're meaningful. Every day when I come in, if I look at them, they're a reminder of my mom and her you know, her impact in my life and, and the love that I have for her even still today. And so they're precious. And so when we think about the Word of God being precious, maybe that's what we think because that's the way the Word of God should be to us, shouldn't it? It should be precious. Although the world may not look at this as something that's of great value, uh, we look at it as the very most precious thing that we have in our lives, the very Word of God. It's from the very gift from which all other gifts flow from this Word of God coming from God Himself. I mean, we covered that this morning, didn't we, about how wonderful the Word of God is. Uh, but when it talks about the Word of God being precious, it means this, there was no open vision. It means this, God was really not speaking to the people of God. And that really sets the foundation for everything that we read in the rest of the chapter because God is not speaking to the people of Israel, and here's the reason why, they're not really listening. Is anyone surprised when we consider the end of the book of Judges? Again, I could go into another five-minute summary of everything we've covered at the end of the book of Judges, but you know already it wasn't good. And this is just a continuation, and certainly Eli and Hophni and Phinehas have just been an extension of that which we had seen at the end of the book of Judges. They were not following the Lord, whether it was the people of the land or whether it was the Levitical priesthood. There was not really a lot of heart for service to God, and as such, God said this, if you're not willing to listen, well, then I'm not going to talk. Now, you and I have 66 books of the canon of Scripture that you and I can read. But back then, they would have just had the five books of Moses and perhaps a little bit more in the book of Joshua, maybe Judges. I don't know exactly for sure. But I do know this, that God primarily spoke verbally to the people of God at that time. And then it was written down as such. And God says this, you're not listening, I'm not talking. But there was one that he knew he could talk to. There was one that he knew was willing to listen, and that would have been Samuel. And so there it was at night, and the uh, lamps were low, and it, that's indicated to us by the lamps of God being out. It says that Eli was uh, not able to see at that time, and of course, uh, and we've mentioned this before, but I believe that was uh, physically, but also spiritually speaking, that his eyes spiritually had become dim, of course, to the sins of his sons as well as to the sin of the people of Israel. And it says, The Lord called Samuel, and he said, Here am I. And I love verse 5. It says, He ran unto Eli. Uh, he, he, Samuel hears this call, and what does he do? He doesn't walk, he runs. He wants to obey. He wants to do what he believes he's being told to do by Eli. But what he doesn't understand, it's not Eli calling him. 
It's God who's calling him. So he runs to Eli, it says verse 5, and he says, Here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, Eli, I called not, lie down again. And he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, uh, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I called not, my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. Now the meaning of this, verse number 7, is this. While Samuel was ministering to the Lord, while Samuel certainly had an understanding of the Lord, could we put it this way? He didn't have a personal walk with the Lord as of yet. It's a reminder when we bring our children to church and we uh, bring them through the nurture and the admonition of the Lord and want them to understand more about God. It's one thing for them to go through the motions of being in church because... Well, mom and dad go to church or because grandma and grandpa go to church. It's another thing entirely for them to have a personal walk with God on their own. And by the way, that's the goal, isn't it? It's not just that the child should be mama called and papa sent uh, when it comes to the things of God. It's that, that we want to desire for them to have a personal walk with God as well. AJ, can you not do that, please? All right, thank you, son. All right, uh, we want them to have a personal walk with God on their own. I'm thankful that when Miss Ruth teaches or when Kaylee teaches, Miss Cassandra has been filling in uh, the children's church the last few weeks. It's not just about here's what your parents believe. It's this, here's what the Word of God says and here's what you need to believe, young person, out of the Word of God. And so Samuel didn't have this full understanding yet, but because in, somewhere within him, there was this desire to do that which was right. Sure didn't come from Eli or Hophni and Phinehas. He had this ability, this willingness uh, uh, to, to answer this calling. But it wasn't just the calling of Samuel that we see here. There was also counsel that was given to Samuel as well. And that comes in the next two verses. Look at verse number eight. It says, and when the Lord called Samuel again the third time, he arose and went to Eli and said, here am I, for thou hast called me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Now, again, it's easy when we read the Word of God to be Monday morning quarterbacks, isn't it? It's easy to look at some of the bad decisions and some of the strange things that people say in the Bible and to say, well, if that was me, I wouldn't have done that, or I wouldn't have said that, or I wouldn't have thought that. But I look at Eli and I say this, it took you three times to figure out that maybe God was in this somewhere. You knew it wasn't you the first time. You knew, definitely knew it wasn't you the second time. You're within the temple. You couldn't have thought. But this shows you how precious the word of God was at that time that he just wasn't expecting God to speak. The thought of God speaking in this type of way, which would have been very normal and very natural when things were right in previous times in Israel, was something that really wasn't at the front of his mind. And he was the high priest. But he perceives, finally, if I could add that in, not to change the word of God, but I would say, finally, he perceives this. And what do we see? It says in verse 9, Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. Now mark that phrase there. Now Eli didn't say a lot of things that were spiritually, well, responsible. But this was maybe, perhaps, the wisest thing that Eli ever said. Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. It says, so Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came, it says, the fourth time and stood and called as he had other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. What did he do? Uh, Samuel was given this counsel by Eli and Samuel says word for word what he was told to say by his father in the faith, if you will, Eli. He says, this is what Eli has told me to say, and this is what I'm going to say. And we'll look at this phrase a little bit more in the moment. But just this idea of speak, Lord, for thy servant, hear it. it many times today, prayer is spoken in reverse. Hear, Lord, for thy servant speaketh. Think about that. Most of the times when we pray today, was hey, Lord, I need you to listen. I got something to say. When really, shouldn't it be the opposite? Lord, speak. Thy servant heareth. I'm willing to listen. I'm willing to take in that which you want to teach me. I want to know what you uh, uh, have for me today. I want you to know what direction you have for me. I want you to know what guidance you have for me. I want you to know what cleansing needs to be made within my life, what I need to repent of that you will forgive me of in turn. Lord, speak for thy servant heareth. And again, we'll look at that more in just a moment. But it wasn't just the calling of Samuel and the counsel that was given to Samuel, but there's also a charge that was laid upon Samuel. There was, there was a charge that was given to him by God. Pick it up again in verse number 11. It says this, And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel, at which both the ears of everyone that heareth it 
shall tingle. Now, we're going to stop there for just a moment. Now, AJ uh, enjoys, oh, hey, there we are, AJ. Uh, AJ enjoys a good tickle, don't you? In fact, you like to call Grandpa the tickle monster, don't you? Because he's going to come and give you a tickle. And when you're a kid and someone comes and gives you a tickle, it's funny. Now, when you're an adult, it's not so funny, is it? <laughs> but when you're that age, uh, it, it, it's kind of humorous, isn't it? In fact, I love hearing their little, their little voices, you know, their little laughter when they're that age and you're tickling them. It's just really a cute thing, isn't it? It is cute and it's sweet and that kind of thing. Isn't that sweet? That's not what God's saying. It's not cute and it's not sweet. Now, I haven't been in many fights in my life. I know that's hard to believe with this pristine face that you have right here, that this face has not seen a lot of fighting over the years. But I do know this, I, I got in a fight once, I believe it was in the fourth or the fifth grade, uh, and uh, the guy came up to me with fists, and I had a lunchbox, one of those hard shell lunchboxes, and he took a swing, and I took a swing with the lunchbox in my hand. Uh, I won, he lost, uh, and uh, my career I am 1-0 uh, with one knockout. But can I tell you that what I found out when I got home after that one knockout made me realize I need to retire while I'm ahead because I don't need to be part of this scene whatsoever. But can I tell you that when that uh, hit him on the side of the head, it didn't tickle? My understanding. And it's interesting that guys like that, when you're a kid, you get in fights with, end up being friends with later. Uh, that's what happened with him. But uh, what ended up happening is, is I found out that what happened to him wasn't a tickle, it was a tingle. You know what we put it? Your bell got rung. When, you, when your ears start ringing, that's a lot different than having uh, your ear tickled, isn't it? And so what God is not saying here is, I'm going to tickle the ears of Israel. By the way, in the New Testament, we're going to find out that ear tickling preaching is not the kind of preaching you need to hear. That, 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 that's, oh, that's kind of pleasing. Oh, that feels good. No, that's not the type of preaching that we're supposed to give as preachers. And that's not the type of preaching we're supposed to submit ourselves to uh, when we're the listeners. No, we need to have the kind of preaching that sometimes is going to make the ear tingle. You know the times, the messages I've needed sometimes? The one that bops me on the side of the head and says, hey, snap out of it. Wake up. No, I'm not talking about rudeness. On behalf of the preacher, I'm not talking about the preacher behaving himself unseemly, but I'm talking about there are times that as the word of God is being preached, the Holy Spirit comes by with a spiritual two by four and says this, wake up. And it makes the ears tingle. And this is what God is saying here in verse number 11. It continues on. In that day, I will perform against Eli all the things which I have spoken concerning his house. Now, what things were spoken concerning his house? We have to go back to the previous chapter, what we just preached on, where we found out that there was this unnamed man, this unnamed prophet who came. He was simply called the man of God. And the man of God came, and what did he do? He told Eli, he says, your family is going to be cut off. You will no longer be part of the Levitical priesthood. And if you remember, it took some generations for this to be the case, but by the time Solomon was king, that his family was completely removed from the Levitical priesthood. Another family was put into their office, and God's word was true, as of course we would expect God's word to be true. But he says this, I want to confirm to you, Samuel, there was something that was said before, and what I said to him before is still in effect. Uh, by the way, God's word isn't just true, it remains true. God's word doesn't just remain true. It will be eternally true. Didn't we just see that? Don't make me preach again from 1 Peter. I got the notes here, but I don't want to go back to them because I can't see them, all right? But if we go back to 1 Peter, we know this. The word of God is eternal. What does it do? It abides forever. It abides forever. And going on here, we see in verse number 12, when I begin, I will also make an end. Listen, when God says something, he's going to see it through to the very end. For I've told him that I will judge his house forever. For the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vile, and what did he do? He restrained them not. And therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli, that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifice nor offering forever. And it says that Samuel laid down till the morning, and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And look at this, Samuel feared to show Eli the vision. We're talking about a young man. Now how old? We don't know. I've heard estimates that he had been anywhere from maybe eight to nine years old to somewhere into his teenage years. But the fact of the matter is, no matter how venerable the commentator is, nobody knows exactly how young he was. We do know this, he was young. And he was young enough that he did not have a personal walk with the Lord at this time, as we saw in verse number seven just a few moments ago. But he knew this, this isn't something I want to tell Eli. 
This is not a message that I want to convey. Listen, as an adult to another adult, we wouldn't want to share this kind of message. But here's a boy having to give this message to the high priest. And not just the high priest, but a man probably that he cares for. A man that probably he didn't see the flaws in, in the way that we see them because we have the word of God. A man that he loved. And he's had to go tell him, God said, he's still going to judge your family. God says he's still going to cut you off from the face of Israel. And he wanted me to tell you that what you heard from that other man of God is still in force. And when God made the beginning, he will make the end. And so what does it say in verse number 16? Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he answered, here am I. There's that word again, that phrase, here am I. He's still saying it, isn't he? He's still available. And I guess, and listen, availability is still good. I'm not downplaying the need for availability tonight. Everything starts with availability. You can't get anywhere until you're available. But it may not just be the greatest ability. But continuing on, it says this, verse number 17, and he said, What is the thing that the Lord hath said unto thee? I pray thee, hide it not from me. God do so to thee, and more also, if thou hide anything from me of all the things that he said unto thee. So Samuel is told by Eli, he says, I am telling you, whatever he said, don't hold back, son. He said, in fact, if you hold back, he says, whatever bad thing, it seems that he knows that there's something bad coming. He said, whatever bad thing was told was going to happen to me, it's going to happen to you. He says, so you just do what's right and you say what you should. And it says, and Samuel told him what? Every wit. Hid nothing from him. What a child. How remarkable. And he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seemeth him good. What an interesting what a fascinating but yet devastating portion of Scripture that we have for us in 1 Samuel chapter number 3. That there's this young man that was spoken to by God. Three different times he was spoken to. Eli being brought into the loop, not discerning until the third time that it was actually the Lord. Eli giving wise counsel. Yes, Eli of all people giving wise counsel to Samuel saying, Samuel, you need to say, speak Lord for thy servant heareth. That's what he did the fourth time. And what does God do? He says, I'm going to do something that's going to make the ears of Israel tingle. He says, I want you to tell Eli that he and his family are finished, that I've confirmed through you what I have said through the unnamed man of God in the previous chapter. And Samuel gets up in the morning despite the pressure to maybe hold back, despite the pressure out of love and compassion to this man Eli who had cared for him to some level to some degree he wants to hold back but what does he do he gives him not just the words he gives him every word down to the last wit the Bible says and he holds nothing back but what's the result of all this what comes from this young man who is willing to say it like it is when God had spoken to him well that's found in the last three verses of the chapter it says this, and Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him. And he didn't let none of his words fall to the ground. And that's an odd turn of phrase maybe that we would use today, that someone wouldn't let their words fall to the ground. It kind of reminds me of, a, well, a glass of water. Thanks for, we planned this out right before church, so that's good. But if you're in a place that maybe needs water very badly, a place where maybe water is scarce, and I can't even imagine maybe a place where thirst would overcome you to such a degree and you had very little water. You would protect that water with your life. What would you do? You want to make sure you didn't spill any of it. You'd want to make sure that not a droplet of it was lost because every drop is life. And so you would want to make sure that none of it, could we put it this way, spilled to the ground. Well, what does he realize here? What does young Samuel realize? That that word of God is life. And that word of God is not to be wasted. And it was precious. God wasn't giving much of it. So when God did turn the spigot a little bit, could we put it that way? When God did turn the spigot and give some of his words, Samuel said this, I can't waste this. I can't hold on to it. I've got to make sure I speak it. If I, God tells me to speak to Eli, I'll speak to Eli. If God tells me to speak to Hophni and Phinehas, I'll speak to Hophni and Phinehas. If I'm to preach to the people of Israel, I'll preach to the people of Israel. Whatever God says... Whatever God says, I'm going to do, and I'm going to hear what he says, and when I hear what he says, then I'm going to give it to the people that he tells me to give. This is a lesson in leadership. He's a faithful young man. And you know what's interesting? In the vacuum of leadership that there was in Israel, in a time where it didn't seem like anybody cared whether anyone was following God or not, look at what it says in verse number 20. 
and all Israel, from Dan, the northernmost point, to Beersheba, the southernmost point of Israel, knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. You know, he was faithful. Despite the culture, despite the climate of the age, there were people that realized this is a man of God. This is a man of God who will tell it like it is. And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. What do we see by the end of the chapter? That this young man who's now growing older, this young man who said, Here am I, and then speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. This man, what does God do? He opens up the spigot. Now, why would he do that? Why was the word of God precious before, but now the Lord is more willing to speak to Samuel than he had in previous generations? And I think this is an important question for us to dwell on for the next few minutes. Why was God more willing to speak to Samuel than he was to Eli or to Hophni or to Phinehas or anyone else in the culture or any of the Levites or anyone else uh, that was there in the temple? Why was God speaking to him in such a way? And I think the answer is found in our text here. Now, let's consider what I was saying about my original statement about availability not being the greatest ability. Again, just to reiterate, it's not that availability isn't important. It is. Everything starts with an availability. Here am I. That phrase, here am I, is found in many important places in the Bible. Just consider this. Abraham, when he was offering Isaac, and when the angel of the Lord spoke to him, and he had the knife in his hand, he was picking up that knife, and the Lord called out to him, and what does he say in Genesis 22? Here am I. He's willing to listen. Uh, Jacob, when he was told by God to go to Egypt to see Joseph, whom he thought he was dead, when God spoke to Jacob, and he was old, and his days were full of trouble, and he was discouraged. This was his own way of describing his own life. But yet when God spoke to him, Jacob said this, Here am I. Moses was at the burning bush. And remember, it wasn't unusual for a bush to burn in the desert because, well, things were dry in the desert. That's just kind of the way it is. But the, bur the bush was burning and it was not consumed. And so because of that, Moses says, I'm going in one direction, but I see the burning bush. It's not consumed. So I'm going to stop the direction I'm going in and I'm going to go look at that bush. And he did so. And the Lord spoke to him out of that bush. And what's the first thing that he said? Here am I. Isaiah was before the Lord in Isaiah chapter 6, one of my favorite chapters in all of the Word of God as we see the Lord high and lifted up and as we see Him in all of His magnificence. And even in that chapter where it talks about the preaching, the proclamation of the Word of God relating to what we read this morning in 1 Peter. And we see all of this and he says, who shall we send and who shall go for us? And Isaiah, if he could, he was just probably jumping up and down and raising his hand and saying, here am I. Send me. You say, how do you know that? Well, he had to have been excited because he saw God high and lifted up. And I'll be honest with you, we'd be more willing to be available to God if we saw God for who he truly is. When we have a small idea of who God is, our availability for him is equally small. But we see how great God is. And we see his magnificence. We say this, God, I'll go anywhere for you. Isn't it amazing the people we'll represent that don't deserve our representation? Isn't it amazing? We represent companies that often, now again, if you're working for a job, you ought to give your job your best. The Bible talks about that. But sometimes we have to represent companies that we know don't have our best interest in mind. There are multi-billion dollar sports organizations. And do you realize that some of the greatest sports teams that are out there right now are being valued for anywhere between four and five billion dollars? The Dallas Cowboys were recently valued for about $5 billion, and that's without winning a Super Bowl for 30 years. And what do they do? And every sports team's the same. We want you to represent us. We want you to advertise for us. And most of the time, what do they do? They have to pay the advertisers. And what do we do? We pay them to advertise on their behalf. And I wore Buccaneers jerseys for who knows how many years when I lived in Tampa, and I was representing a pretty bad brand. There were years they won two games, three games a year. Some of you remember that with the Patriots this last year. Anyway, um, anyway, boy, it got too close to home, didn't it? That's all right. 
I took the kids to the Patriots Hall of Fame last week, by the way, just to get them out of the house, and I realized there's nothing new in the last three or four years here in this Hall of Fame. But anyway, that, that, you, you, probably, you probably don't want to hear my commentary on that at the moment. I don't need to give it. But anyway, isn't it amazing who will represent because we consider their greatness? It's a great company. Uh, it's a formidable company. It's a Fortune 500 company. Oh, it's a great sports team. It's a great sports town. Uh, they've won titles before. But listen, when we realize, when we realize how high and lifted up and how magnificent God is, why wouldn't we say, Lord, I'll do anything that you want me to do. Here am I. Send me. And that's what Isaiah did in Isaiah chapter 6. When he saw the Lord high and lifted up, there was no other response that could come out of his mouth. But here am I. Ananias, before baptizing Paul, do you remember when Paul got saved and he was blind and he was on the street called Straight in Acts chapter 9? And Ananias was told of God, go baptize Saul. And Ananias says, oh, you mean that man that was coming to kill us all? He says, well, he believes in Christ now. And when God spoke to Ananias, the first thing he said is, here am I. The phrase, here am I, is vital. But I'd also say this. There were some in the Bible who would say, here am I. But when the Lord gave them the assignment, they'd end up checking out. Uh, uh, Eli was always around the temple. You know, whenever we see him in these verses, these chapters, he's always around. But you know what? Who's God using? Hannah. Who's God using? An unnamed man of God. Who's God using? A boy. But who's God not speaking to? Eli. It, it, it's almost uncomfortable when you realize that God is speaking to everybody but Eli. He's there but he's just there. The Lord's not speaking to him. I think of Peter. Peter says, I'll go with you to the death, Lord. Well, he was available until he wasn't. And then when the chips were down, what happened? He was off. And it took him quite a while to be able to reconcile truly with the Lord again until the end of the book of John when he said, feed my lambs. Feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. Remember that? And truly was able to be reconciled back to the uh, love of Christ once again. Oh, sure. There were, we give you example after example of those who said, here am I at some point, but yet then removed themselves from that which God wanted them to do their life. And, and so this is what I want to get at here tonight in just these few moments that we have at the end of the message. It's understanding this, that everything starts with someone being willing to be used, but there's more to the Christian life than that. Here am I, Lord, must always be followed by, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. Without the latter, the former is meaningless. You can say, here am I, and that's good. That's part of the Christian experience. But unless that is followed up with the fact where you say, Lord, speak, for thy servant heareth, it renders the first absolutely useless. To have the mentality, to have the heart, where any time we come into the house of God, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. Well, pastor, I've heard all the sermons before. Well, I don't know because sometimes I'm not sure I've heard the sermons before. I'm the one that comes up with them. But I know the mentality could sometimes be, well, you know, I've heard this before. We've read this passage before. No, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. Well, I've read the Bible through before. I don't know. Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. Well, I've known the Lord for many years now. Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. You know, it's interesting when we come into church, it's good that we fellowship together when we come to church. It's good that we work around the room. It's good that we're able to talk with one another, even in a small church. There should be no cliques. There should be no groups where certain people go in this corner or that corner, that everyone should be comfortable speaking with everybody at any given time. That, that's what the people of God ought to do. We talked about this in 1 John last week, chapter number 2, that we're to love the brethren, and that's how we express our love for God is through the love of the brethren. Uh, but beyond that, you know, sometimes if we're not careful, the, the general thought process of coming in to church is, is almost like coming in before a basketball game. And everyone comes in, everyone's talking, everyone's rowdy, everyone's... And look, I don't want to dampen the spirit before a church. I don't want to do that one bit because I enjoy it when people are comfortable and love being around one another and smile in church. Uh, please, 
for heaven's sake, smile in church, all right? I'm asking you, I'm begging you, I'm, I get on my knees right now, I could smile in church. God wants you to smile in church, and we want you to smile too, okay? It's a good thing to smile in church, but at the same time, there must be this process before we come into the building, or there must be this process maybe in just a few moments after we come into the building, where we just take a, t a moment and humble ourselves and say something like this, Lord, I'm here, but beyond that, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. There's some things that are going to be said tonight. Lord, will you speak? Because I need to hear you. See, what I'm afraid is oftentimes as Christians, if we're not careful, we get the, not the here am I mentality, but the I'm here mentality. And the I'm here mentality is this. And I've seen this portrayed by people through the years. And if I'm not careful, I can portray it myself. It's the idea of this. I'm here. What more do you want? I'm here. Look, pastor, what do you want out of me? I'm here. And look, we're glad you're here. We count people because people count. There's one of those trite sayings, one that I say all the time. It's true. The Bible has a book called Numbers, so we count numbers too. I mean, it's important. But we understand these things. But at the same time, there's more to the Christian experience than just coming and sitting and saying, I'm here. It's important that you're here. We're glad that you're here. But perhaps even greater than the ability of simply being here is the ability to say this, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. See, what God is desiring for Liberty Baptist Church is not just to simply have a group of people that's here, and I'm thankful the group that's here is growing. I look around on a Sunday night, and it's growing. I, I was talking to someone on Wednesday night who said it was hard to find a parking spot on Wednesday night. That's a blessing because it's growing. We're thankful for that. We've been in a time of where it hasn't been growing, and we've seen tremendous growth over the last 18 months. Thank the Lord for it. But at the same time, if we just simply get to the point where we say, I'm here, Lord, be happy with the fact that I'm here, we've missed the vital part because Eli was there, but he wasn't willing to be spoken to. Why was the spigot opened? Here's the reason. The spigot was opened to the one who said, Lord, I'm willing to speak. And when you do, I'm not going to let any of it fall to the ground. I'm going to take every word. I'm going to take every thought. I'm going to take every rebuke. I'm going to take every encouragement. I'm going to take everything that you give me, and you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to drink it in. And then once I'm revitalized by what I drink in, then I'm going to give it out. And that's what Samuel did. He took it in, but what did he do? He gave it back out. And other people recognized, wow, this guy's different than Eli. Wow, this guy is different than Hophni and Phinehas. There's something different about him, a fire that's within him. And listen, I want people to come into Liberty Baptist Church and not just say, oh, isn't this quaint? It's a small church. Isn't this quaint? It's just like a family. Isn't this nice? They sing old-fashioned hymns. Isn't this nice? I mean, uh, people shook my hand and people were very nice to me. You know, I want beyond that to say, whoa, these people are serious about the Word of God. These people wanting to live out their faith. There's people that want to pray with me after church. There's people that want to fellowship with me. There's people that want to meet with me during the week and, and try to be a blessing and a help to me. There's something real about it. And it's like when the word of God is given, it's just like they're little birds with their mouths open waiting for the mama to come with the worms. Not that I'm a mama bird. Don't call me that. But the idea that, uh, it, that it's just that expectancy that that young bird would have, that expectancy is so hungry that they know we're not eating unless it's given to us, and if we're given it, we're going to take every bit of it because we don't know we're going to get the next meal. Here am I. Good. Praise God. But speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. I've told you before, we have far too many Alka-Seltzer Christians, trite saying number three, will come in and plop and fizz, but there's not much more than that. Oh, God wants more. No, I don't want more for you. God wants more for you. Now, I, I also do as the under shepherd of this church. I, I see that God can do more for you. But do you realize that over time God wants to speak to you and God wants to bring out more within you? And you say, well, pastor, I've known the Lord for a while. There's been years and years that I know the Lord. Well, then you need to be more in tune because the fact of the matter is our ears can become dull the longer we know the Lord because we think we've heard it all, but we haven't heard it all. 
and we think we made all the changes, and we haven't made all the changes. Now things are different as you grow older in the Lord. I think of it like a block of marble when the sculptor is going to try to make it into whatever he's trying to make it into. At first, he uses the large chisel. What does he do? He takes off big chunks from that marble. Why? Because it's nowhere near what it needs to be. But as time goes on and it starts to take shape, does he continue to use the big chisel? I would imagine not. He uses finer tools with more precision strikes. But what does he do? He keeps chipping. He keeps working until the block matches the representation of that which he's trying to achieve. When you first get saved, chunks just fall off, don't they? Entire genres of music change in your life. Or they ought to. Entire conversations change in our life. Or they ought to. The things we look at ought to change. The things that entertain us ought to change. And all of a sudden, those big chunks fall off, and you feel like, man, my life is different. And it is different. And by the way, it's supposed to be different. We're new creatures. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's what we're supposed to do. But as we grow older, sometimes we think that God's not speaking to us because those big chunks don't. Look, if those big chunks keep falling off the rest of your life, there's a problem. Because you've made some of those big decisions. Okay. I'm going to move around a little bit because I want to make sure Dave's following, but that's okay. All right, good. You tell him I'm getting loopy. Diane needs to come home. That's where we're going right now. No, let's just get down, to, get down to brass tacks here. I don't struggle with taking God's name in vain. I don't. I don't struggle. AJ, please. Daddy's making a point. Thank you. Um, I don't struggle with cussing anymore. Now, if you met me when I was 15, you would not have discerned my manner of speech from any kid that you saw out there waiting at the bus stop today. Tim, you're a pastor. I wasn't when I was 15. I wasn't even saved. And I talk like the world. I'm not proud of that. I'm just being real with you. But do you know, I don't really struggle with that today. If I stub my toe, those words have been removed from my vocabulary so long that, uh, you know, some other word, you know, uh, is replaced with what I would have said when I was 15. That big chunk has been taken off. Oh, but don't, listen, don't think that I'm what I need to be yet. Because he has to get that fine tool out and says, you know what? You didn't cuss at that guy, but you're angry at him. Oh, you didn't, you didn't cuss her out, but you have bitterness at what she did to you. And there's still work to be done. But we think because we don't cuss, we don't chew, and we don't run with those who do. Trite saying number four. I'm pulling out every old independent Baptist saying for those of you that have been around for a while. But we think that we're done with our Christian experience and our Christian growth because we've got those big things out of the way. Listen, do you realize until you pass on and meet the Lord, there's still work to be done? And he still wants to speak to you? You know why I want to come Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night? It's an opportunity for God to speak to me. You say, well, you're the pastor. You get to preach. No, no, no. Those are vessels that still God speaks to me. Because remember, before he speaks to you through these messages, he has to speak to me. Because I have to be able to make sure that I'm right before the Lord. But we can't be to the point where we just say, I'm here. And not say, Lord, speak for your servant here. This is a big difference. God calls out all to be available but we see in this passage that he will not typically continue to speak until we acknowledge that we're willing to listen. If you're not willing to listen, eventually, guess what happens? The word of God becomes precious. The way he speaks to your heart becomes a little bit more quiet. Oh, does the Holy Spirit depart from you? No, no, that's bad theology. If you're saved, he's with you for life. But can you quench him so that you don't hear him as much? I think we would all say we've had seasons in our life where that's not been the case. Jesus often said this, he who has ears, let him hear. John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. 
And as God's children, we're expected to hear his voice. John 8, 47, he that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not because you are not of God. Now, I'm not saying if you do not hear God's words that you are not saved. What I'm saying is this. If you are not listening to the words of God, you are exemplifying a characteristic that is very much with the unsaved lives. And I don't want to have a characteristic of the unsaved in my life. But not listening to the word of God is one. And this is really where the message this morning and the message tonight link up together, isn't it? The scriptures are supreme. They are. They don't measure up in any other way. Don't do that, please. They, there, there's nothing else that measures up to it. But to say the scriptures are supreme and then not to in turn say, but speak so thy servant heareth. Starts with being in the word of God. Reading the word of God and studying the word of God. Both are important. Reading and studying. I was reading just, just yesterday, uh, what one preacher said something like this, that, that reading the Bible is like going across a lake in a speedboat. And studying the word of God is like going across the same lake in a glass-bottomed boat. One gets you where you need to go and helps you understand the lay of the land. The other helps you see the riches and depth of what's underneath. Both are needed. Both are needed. What do we need? Do you be in the word of God? But let the word of God then speak to us through the Holy Spirit. Or he says, this is you. This is you. I was, just reading the, I was just reading the Bible this morning, getting ready for church. And I'm reading a text I've read, the text I've preached through before. And where it mentions the Anakims in the book of Joshua. The Anakims were the ones that the Israelites were so afraid of that they ended up wandering around the wilderness for 40 years. And it ends up the Anakims were overcome. And it was so uneventful that it was mentioned in three verses in the book of Joshua. And I looked at that this morning, and the Lord just gave me a fresh thought there, this idea of, you know, it's amazing the things that we think are so worrisome and so troublesome and are the things that are going to be life-changing. Many of them just end up being footnotes in history. They're things that are almost forgettable. And the Israelites wandered around for 40 years about something that consumed three verses of the book of Joshua. You know what? God gave that to me this morning. He didn't give that to you. Now, it's in your Bible. If it's not, we've got a problem. It's in your Bible. But God gave it to me. He spoke to me this morning. You know how precious that is? The God of the universe wants to speak to you. But it doesn't happen with the people that have the I'm here mentality. It goes beyond when we say, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. There's a story about a game warden in a not too far away county who received word that a poacher was shooting deer out of season on his property. The poacher had been up these, to these shenanigans for some time, but no one had been able to catch him in the act. So one morning, the game warden decided to sneak up to the man's property, spy on him, catch him in the act of poaching, and arrest him. Before dawn, the game warden left his car out by the road, hiked deep into the woods, and quietly made his way to the thick brush just behind the alleged poacher's cabin. A few minutes went by in the still of that morning before he saw a light come on in the cabin. A few minutes later, the back door opened. The man stepped out in the cold air, he cupped his hands to his mouth and shouted, Hey, warden, you want to come in for a hot cup of coffee? Well, the game warden was dumbfounded. He sat there for a second, but figuring that his cover was blown anyway, there was no sense in sitting out there in the cold for the rest of the day. He stood up from his hiding place and said, Sure, sounds good. Two men went into the cabin and sat down for a coffee. After a few moments, the warden looked across the table and said, I have one question for you. How did you know I was out there this morning to spy on you? The poacher said, well, I didn't. But every morning I open my door and call for you just in case you're there. I like that. Scott, do you know that? Anyway, but uh, day after day, God steps out into the cold of the morning of the world, cupping hands to his mouth and calls us in. Come, friend, have a cup of coffee. Come, most beloved ones, receive this bread. Come, drink of this water. Come, see greater things. Come and see. But this is only available for those who are willing to listen for the master to speak. He calls out every day. Come here. I want to speak to you. I want to speak to you. But really, that's only going to be reserved to the ones who respond. What? Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. And if we do so, 
and we don't let any of his words fall to the ground. I'm not talking about him giving you extra biblical visions. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about some charismatic experience. What I'm talking about is that he will take his word and he will apply it to your heart in such a way that he's going to keep chipping away at all the excess in your life until we are becoming, as close as we can in this life, conformed to the image of Christ. Here am I must always be followed by speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. Where are you with that tonight? With all heads bowed and all eyes closed. You're here. Thank God. There's no sarcasm in my voice whatsoever when I say that. I thank God that you are here tonight. But may Liberty Baptist Church not be a church simply of people who are here, who are in attendance. But beyond that, may we be the type of people that regularly come to church, that regularly read our, read our Bibles and say this, Lord, speak for thy servant heareth. I have a feeling the more you say that, the more he'll speak to you. The more willing you are, the more he'll make application. The more you allow him to make those small chisels in your life, the more he'll continue to speak to you to chisel more away so that we can come into the image of Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, be with us during this invitation time now. Allow us to be people that readily come before you and say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth in Jesus' name. With all heads bowed and all eyes closed, no one looking around. If God's spoken to you, the altar is open. There's no piano playing, but God is with us. What more is needed? So speak to the Lord if he's spoken to you tonight. As some come to the altar where you come this evening and leave with your heart right before the Lord tonight. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this night. We thank you for speaking to us. Lord, may us not let any of these words spill to the ground. Samuel was a leader. He was a man who changed Israel because he was willing to listen to you. He was willing to make the changes that were needed to be made. Lord, help us to have the same heart this evening. Not just to say, I'm here. But beyond that, to say, I'm here. But now that I'm here, will you speak to me? And if we all as a church exemplify this type of living, there is no limit to what you can do with Liberty Baptist Church. Thank you for this night. See you safety as we travel home. In Christ's name, amen. I'll give you two prayer requests before we go very briefly. First, if you'd pray for Diane's mother, Christine. She actually broke her wrist a couple days ago and we're having surgery tomorrow. And so it should be fairly minor, but at the same time, uh, it's something that needs to be taken care of. And so it was unexpected. And so if you would pray for Christine tomorrow as Diane and Kaylee travel home. And then secondly, uh, if you pray for the Amundis, you mentioned in men's prayer this morning, the fact that they will be meeting with their landlord this afternoon. Uh, many of you remember that when they moved here, they moved into a, a really good situation where the Lord provided for a lot of their needs, not in a situation that was free by any sense, but definitely below market. But at the same time, they knew that that situation would be temporary sometime around June, very likely that they would need to be moving out of that place and finding a new place. They found out today that they'll actually be needing moving out at May 1st. And so a little bit more accelerated than what was anticipated. And so as we were just talking this afternoon, the Lord didn't bring them all the way up here from Georgia and provide for their every need just to drop them off on the side of the highway at this point. 
The Lord's going to take care of them. But at the same time, that's easy for us to say when we all go home tonight and we're fairly certain that we'll still be living there in three months. And so for them, we want to continue to pray for them. I'd also say if you have any kind of uh, knowledge of a place to stay or anything like that, I've made this appeal to you before. But if you know of any place, uh, it was just a connection through a church, another church, that this was made for the Imundis, and maybe the same could happen here. Uh, at the same time, I'm not asking you to uh, specifically take care of this, but if you have information, that could be a help. Uh, you can let me know, but more specifically, let Brother Dan uh, know, and so that way they can make the decisions they need to. But the best way we can help them at this point is to pray for them and to pray that the Lord would just make something available. But uh, he wanted me to convey that to you tonight, and I want to... I'm going to mention it before the message, but I really want to say it now just because I want us to make sure that as we leave that it's on our hearts and on our minds. So uh, let's do so with that tonight and uh, encourage them by praying and then just checking up on them. And I know that they would appreciate that. But uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful crowd again here this evening. I'm just looking around about, about 30 or so folks here tonight on a Sunday night. Praise God. I'll tell you, that's great. Uh, I remember times on Sunday night, I think there was three uh, outside of our family. So I'll take 30. Praise the Lord. Uh, thank you for being here with us tonight. If you're watching online as well, God bless you. Have a wonderful evening. We're looking forward to seeing you on Wednesday. You're dismissed. Thank you.